Let's get it. This is Life's Essential Ingredients with Jeff and a mic, where we hope to inform, inspire, and transform lives one essential ingredient at a time. Welcome to the show. Here we go again. Wayne, Wayne, I got to give you a quick shout out. I just love that uh, intro that you did for us. So thank you so much for that. We are Life's Essential Ingredients coming from Vacaville season two, episode 43 with Dr. Aaron Ahuvia, who's visiting us from Ann Arbor, Michigan. And he's talking mess about his football team. I don't know what they're ranked right now, but number three or four uh, and having a great season. Uh, and first place where you can find Dr. Ahuvia He's all over the place, but his best site is his books website, thethingswelove.com. Thethingswelove.com, best place to find him. So about our guest, Dr. Ahuvia is a professor of marketing at the University of Michigan, Dearborn College of Business. He received his PhD in marketing from Northwestern University's Kellogg College of Business, where along with conducting original research, he assisted legendary professor Philip Kotler with a revision of his classic textbook. An independent analysis of research impact ranked Dr. Ahuvia 22 in the world, number 19 in the US for research influence in consumer behavior. He has been quoted in Time, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and has appeared on popular radio and television shows such as the Oprah Winfrey Show. If that was not enough, in July of 22, Dr. Ahuvia authored The Things We Love. In his book, Dr. Ahuvia presents astonishing discoveries that prove we are far less rational than we think when it comes to our possessions and hobbies. In fact, we have passionate relationships with the things we love, and these relationships are driven by influences deep within our culture and our biology. Dr. Ahuvia, thanks for dedicating your life to research and for living your purpose, and Life's Essential Ingredients welcomes you to the show. Oh, thank you so much, Jeff. It's really a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm excited. We we get usually when you record these, you talk for like a brief kind of moment or two uh, to the guest, just kind of checking in. And uh, I got all carried away uh, in preparation for the show, started talking about love and how I was starting to think about that and how I was struggling just to figure that out. So this is going to be an exciting episode. I hope listeners, you could just get in to a, a place where you can just sit and kind of think. Um, because I think this one's going to get a little bit deep. Um, and then we always start, uh, Dr. Ahuvia, with uh, a quote, a uh, thought of the day. And this one uh, is from your mentor. Uh, and uh, so here it is. Be a cause, not just a business. Have a higher mission. Why would I pick that one for you? So that's a quote from Philip Kotler? Yes. Yeah. That makes sense. He says that sort of thing. Um, I think you would pick it perhaps because when it comes to the things that people love, we're looking for deeper meaning. Uh, there's a lot of things that, you know, a can opener that just works really well opening cans. You, you appreciate that can opener, but you probably don't love that can opener. If you if there's something that you really love, it works well, but it also connects to deeper meanings in your life. And I think what Professor uh, Kotler was getting at there was that if you're a company and you want people to love your products, you have to behave in a way that is consistent with the ethical, moral, and personal sort of meanings that people want to increase in their own life. I love it. I love it. And yeah, and, and you hit it out of the park for me, but uh, in, in someone that's spent so many years of his life just researching, hey, what what drives that deep meaning, mm -hmm. even for these inan inanimate objects um, that uh, we're going to get into, um, it is that sense uh, of purpose and deep meaning that makes that connection and brings something uh, to life. And, and I'll start off with 
I had the, the good fortune of doing the Camino de Santiago. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Wow, that's quite the hike. That's yeah, impressive. my wife, yeah. I, I have a few health challenges. And so we started in Pamplona and then we finished it. And so we did about 731 kilometers. Uh, wow. And uh, by the time you're done, because you get to the town or city, then you walk around. So we probably did about 600 miles or so um, on that How journey. How long did that take you? The whole month of May. <laughs> yeah, we started May 1st and finished the 31st. And it was a, it was a good challenge, but... I, I fell in love with so many things and I guess going back to, so I, I, I'm weird when, it, when something happens to me and I, I want to capture it with something that I love. So I right. want you to kind of interpret this a little bit here for me. And so we were uh, going through uh, Santo Domingo de la Calzada and Santo Domingo, the town was named after him and he's, you know, St. Dominic. I won't get into that whole story, but that, his being just spoke to me so much in the church and then seeing what he stood for and then starting to research him uh, and finding out his values. And I fell in love mm -hmm. and, and I needed to get something that I wear this every day and, and his presence in my life on the daily, even though he died in, I think 10, 19 um, is something that guides, guides me uh, every day with love in my heart. Uh, and so interpret a little bit of, of what I'm even talking about, because I'm still processing that journey. I mean, it is such a transformative experience that every day, and that was all the way May 31st. And here we are, you know, November 10th, I'm still kind of processing what happened on that trip and the, the effect of me falling in love with Santo Domingo. Right. So what you've just said is a perfect example of why some of the sort of critiques of materialism while coming from a good place are a lot too simplistic. So there are real problems with materialism and we can get into that later, um, absolutely. Uh, my definition that you know works for me on what materialism is, is you know, you're using money and the things it can buy, whether they're actually physical objects or services or what have you, in ways that are very ego focused and that are damaging to other people uh, in sorts of ways. So I see that as a very bad thing. But there is another view of materialism that is sort of anti-physical object, right? It's like, there's something wrong with physical objects. And, this, this, and this comes from a cosmology, really an ancient cosmology, um, which you can see in uh, Plato and Socrates, as well as uh, some early Christian writers. And it's this view that like the heaven, the really the good world is this non-physical plane. And the physical world is the source of pain and imperfection. And they, if we're going to, you know, improve our, ourselves in any way, we have to transcend the physical world and, and end up in this non-physical world. And, and that cosmology, I think, is just wrong. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with the physical world. I think it's a wonderful place. Uh, it's got all kinds of problems. And yes, all kinds of pain that comes with it. But um, it's also got all kinds of joy and love and, and great things that come with it. And what you're talking about there was a situation in which you had a real sort of a spiritual epiphany. But then uh, the people who were are just listening to this couldn't see that you were holding up a medallion that you wear around your neck that you bought as a souvenir to help you sort of concretize and remember that experience. Um, that works for a lot of people. Having that tangible souvenir of the experience helps them remember that experience. It helps them keep the experience with them. And when I talk to people about things that they love, very often I'll just, you know, open it up. I'll just say, is there anything that you love that isn't another person? And see what they come up with. 
very, very often, they are exactly that kind of thing. It's a, it's a tangible memento of an important past experience that helps them remember and connect to their life history. And in your case, connect to this you know, profoundly spiritual event that you had. And I think that's great. Um, I don't, the, the, also in terms of the research, uh, people who do that um, tend to have good relationships with other people. There are ways that people use objects that are detrimental to their relationships with other people. But when people, for example, treasure a photograph of themselves with a friend or a family member, using objects that way strengthens your relationships with other people. And I think it's a mistake to think that somehow because a photograph is a physical object that there's something wrong going on there. Man. Well, I appreciate your insight and I'm glad that I'm doing okay with it. And yeah, it's not that anybody barely even knows that this is here. It's just like for me that just yeah. helps, helps drive me and, and keep me focused uh, on being present. Um, but let's take a step back of what was life like? I always like the listeners to kind of know uh, a little bit, and it's a broad question, but growing up for you, pick uh, any any part of your life and and uh, share kind of what, what life was like for you growing up. Huh. All right. So um, I actually, I'm back in my hometown, Ann Arbor. I grew up in Ann Arbor. Uh, I grew up in what it was... I guess people now say a very privileged existence. My parents did not have a lot of money by any means. My dad was a college professor, um, and did not make a, a lot of money, but we were very stable. Um, it was a very stable middle-class home. All my friends' parents were also college professors. So it was a very kind of educated uh, environment in that way. Uh, and I really, I had a pretty good youth Especially my, you know, when I when I talk to many people my age, um, they tell sort of one horror story or another about their childhood, and I certainly had hard times, but I can't participate very well in those conversations because I don't really have any horror stories to tell uh, uh, about the whole thing. Um, but I will say, relevant to what we're talking about here, I've always had uh, this sort of very conflicted relationship myself with stuff and with money. Um, I've always had sort of a philosophical opposition to materialism. And I have always seen that as a problem. But I've also known in myself, for example, that I really like making money. Spending money is nice. There's some people who really like spending money and they don't care about making it. Those people are in debt. Uh, I have a much nicer combination that, you know, I like spending money. It's okay. But um, I like making money. I always had jobs and little businesses. I used to start businesses when I was a kid and work very hard at them. And, uh, I, you know, that's sort of a part of my personality. It's not that weird that I'm a business school professor uh, in that regard. But at the same time, I've always been very politically aware of the problems Uh that come with uh, too much wealth in too few hands, and that come when people prioritize their, their money over the people around them and the other people in their community. And, and so that's been something that I've worked on for a, a long time in trying to sort that out for myself. Yeah, that's interesting. When do you think you first had that awareness growing up? What, like what age? High school. So high school. I was in a, I went to a, a high school. It's actually called community high school. And it's kind of a little bit well-known because it was one of these alternative schools that was started at the early 1970s. And it's one of the few that have been extremely successful, it's still extremely successful around today. Um, and it had a very progressive political kind of community. And being, you know, anti-materialist was certainly the norm 
there, right? We all walked around in torn jeans and not the kind of expensive torn jeans you buy pre-torn, but the kind of torn jeans you buy because you tore your jeans because you're not, you know, you're not buying a new pair. Yeah, the babies uh, kind of, are old. They got some, yeah. some years on them. <laughs> yeah, so long hair, ponytails, bandanas, torn jeans, uh, yeah. you know, t-shirts, that kind of a thing. Um, and that was the ethos. And I very much, I still find that uh, attractive in a lot of ways. Um, but there I was already, you know, I had this business where I was putting up, I had this clever business and I have to, truth is it wasn't my idea. I, I got the idea from someone who needed help with the, who actually wanted me to work for him doing this. But there was a lot of, uh, we used to put up posters, these little flyers, whenever there was a band that was going to play in a bar, the way that they got the word out around campus was to just put up flyers all over the place. And there were about four or five bars that needed this done. And so what I would do is I would do it for say three of them, but all at the same time. So I charged them each three bucks an hour, which is a bargain for them, but I'd be making nine bucks an hour. And this was like a long time ago. This was, <laughs> this was, this was in the, the 1970s when $9 an hour. And of course I wasn't paying taxes on it because I was like, a, you know, a 10th grader, ninth grader. That, that was a lot of money for a kid, right? Oh, at that yeah. point. Um, and sometimes I do better than that. And, you know, I still, I'm very interested. I've got a, a, a nice stereo. I, I love that thing now. But I used the money then to buy myself a, a really nice, you know, what was by the standards at the time, uh, a nice stereo. So I was kind of aware that um, I didn't, there, there was something within me that that liked a lot of this stuff. Uh, even though I, I was, as I said, also very aware of, you know, the problems that can come with it. Yeah, it's, I just keep in listening to you. I just keep, uh, you know, I think everybody values time, but I don't know why that, that word just keeps coming to my head. And, and then hearing that, you know, you keep life simple by not acquiring so many material things, which takes a lot of time to research and go get and set up and so on and so forth. Have you found that uh, you, you just put your, your effort and your energy into to so many other things? And this is a weird question. I don't know if you'd be able to answer it because you don't waste time on researching so many things like right now, for example, I'm uh, uh, for my nonprofit, I need a, a, a power source uh -huh. to, to plug in some lights, some outdoor lights uh, for a pizza truck. And so I try and do everything on the cheap. So I'm on Facebook trying to get on there and get the best deal, but I'm wasting so much time on that. And it really, I can feel not anxiety, but I can just feel like, oh man, I'm wasting time doing this, but we don't really have the money to go out and just buy a new one. And I like, you know, uh, not having to go buy new things all the time and using something that somebody else had that wants to pass on. Um, but so to get back to your, to your question, I mean, yeah, what do you do with all your time? Cause you're probably saving so much time and you've done that your whole life when it's probably why you're so successful at, at what you do. Oh, I, Many people I, I are extremely busy today, and I am one of them. Uh, I look at my email inbox, and my heart just sinks because there is <laughs> so many emails in there, and everyone is like a little to do item, like another thing that I ought to be doing. It's not just like something to read. Right? Yeah. There, are, there are little work assignments that I, that I'm getting further and further behind on, and every day. I, I think, oh, I'm going to chip away at this list, but somehow when I go to bed, it's longer than it was in the morning. Uh, so I do, not, you know, I, I feel very, very uh, busy. I wish I was better at this. Um, I have a philosophy about this, though, in terms of just overall busyness. And that is that problems are inevitable. If you think of what a problem is, as soon as you have a goal, you have a problem. Because if you want, like, I want to walk across the street, well, then it's a problem that you're not across the street. And it's, you know, it's a problem that you have to walk across there. So you can't have a goal of any kind without inherently also having problems. And since we want to have goals, that's, that's what makes life rich and interesting, we're always going to have problems. So once you realize you're always going to have problems, 
you stop, or you could, if you're good at it, stop thinking, how do I solve all my problems? Because that's never going to happen. And start thinking, what are the better problems to have? What are the worst problems? And what are the better problems? And a lot of people, especially people who are professionally fairly successful, one of their problems is that they have just so many things they want to do, they don't have time to do them all. And I think the proper response to that is to say, yeah, that is a genuine problem, but boy, that's a good problem to have <laughs> compared, with, compared with a lot of other people's problems, right? Too yeah. many things you want to do and you can't get them all done is, is a good problem to have. <sighs> I, I love what you're saying. I really love you. Yeah, what are the, and just so you know, I'm not on my phone. I'm taking notes. You know, I started this, this podcast to just help one listener. And uh, that one listener has always been me. Uh, and at the end of every episode, I have three or four pages of notes. And now we got listeners in 36 countries and like 460 cities. And uh, so, yeah, but I love what are the better problems to have. And it just ties in so well with our show life's essential ingredients what's truly essential in your life and what do you want to invest your life doing and learning and growing uh so we can appreciate this time that we have knowing this might be our last day uh and, and so putting the energy uh into solving those problems and looking at them as just an opportunity uh to live this life um, and so with that, you know, what are your essential, you said, uh, uh, you're busy, you got a lot of stuff going on. How do you manage? I always love the, the guests to share. What are some things that are essential in your life that have to be there every day that allow you to live your best life? Community, community with friends and, and family is right at the top of that list. I mean, it's obviously it's, it's, there's other things there too. But I've always been very oriented around that. Um, when I was in high school, <laughs> the, the show The Love Boat was on. Yeah, I remember that one. And uh, my friends had a nickname for me. Sometimes they would call me the cruise director because that was one of the <laughs> characters on The Love Boat. And the cruise director was always like organizing the social events. Yeah. And, and I was the guy who was always organizing all of the social events. And I did that at the time because I was socially a little bit awkward. Um, boy, that's not going to be a surprise to most people that, you know, uh, nerdy guy was socially awkward when he was in high school, right? That no, no, <laughs> no big news there. But you know, I was. And um by organizing the events, I was always going to be included in them. So that was a little bit of a of a social strategy. And with later as I got older and got socially less awkward, I kind of wanted to stop doing that because I felt it had a kind of a stigma to it that, well, maybe it is something that I was doing because I was nervous that I wouldn't be invited otherwise, mm -hmm. right? If I hadn't, if I wasn't doing that. And, and at that, you know, at a later point when uh, I was better with my social relationships, that wasn't a problem anymore. I didn't want to do that. Now um, I'm 58 years old. So I'm, you know, well into, into my middle age. I recently decided that I'm going to uh, take up the, the cruise director mantle again and, uh, you know, take it up with, with, with pride and with a sense of fun because it is something that, that I do naturally tend to do. And it's not something that everybody's able to do. It's, some, it's a way that I can really make a contribution. And I'm aware of the research about how many lonely people there are. Uh, it used to be that, uh, I may get the first number here wrong, I'm doing this from memory, but the uh, median answer to the question, how many close friends do you have? I think used to be three around 1950. Right now, the, the answer, the median answer 
for how many close friends you have is zero. So what that means is more than half the people answering the question say they have zero close friends. That's a horrifying number. And I'm happy to contribute, you know, to my local community by playing the cruise director a little bit, um, if, if that can have, help chip away at that for myself and everybody else. Yeah, I, I love that you're taking on that role and um, that you're building up your community. And I, yeah, I totally, you're, it was a fact, but yeah, I agree. So my, my well, a couple of jobs ago, I was a college nurse on uh, Sacramento City College's campus, which is a very diverse campus, about 22,000 students there. And um, we didn't necessarily have, we had a lot of counselors, but they were more academic counselors you know, and you know, in education, I mean, UM is, is so different, but your education is slowly catching up now that they realize they need to provide more mental well being services. And so a lot of times the students would come to the nurses, you know, and, mm -hmm. and we weren't counselors and you would stay within your scope of practice. But I can't tell you how many students over about the 14 year period would come to me and I would ask them, Hey, how many people do you have in your life that you can go have a, a good conversation with? And so many of them said not more than one. And yeah. many, many, many times it was zero. Yeah. And it just would always break my heart, you know? And, um, and so, yeah, I, I won't get into what I tried to do to fix that. Like you, uh, I wouldn't give myself the cruise director uh, appointment, but uh, tried to take action towards making uh, opportunities available for students to to get to just come and and create space to just be who they are uh, and develop friendships. And I think now with COVID, that has become so much more challenging um, because we've lost that touch a little bit. And so, uh, um, yeah, no, I'm, uh, happy for, for you and your, your community. Uh, let's get in, let's get into you and, and what you're doing professionally. You know, I've, you know, taken your, your story. Um, but my question specifically, what was your fascination with wanting to spend your life, you know, researching, you know, what people, you know, love. So, it's kind of a funny story how I got into this. Uh, I was in the PhD program in marketing, and we've mentioned his name a couple times already, Professor Kotler, I was in his class, and he was mentioning how everything is marketing, even dating is marketing. You're like, you're marketing yourself to the person you're going out on the date with. I was single at the time, and I thought that dating was way more interesting than real marketing. So I asked him if I could do my term paper on like dating as marketing. And he was very enthusiastic. And he actually connected me to another faculty member, Professor Mara Edelman, who had collected some data on a dating service. And this was just as the dating services were starting to become a little bit popular in the United States. And so we ended up writing five major papers on dating services. And this was fun. We were the big experts on dating services. I got on the Oprah Winfrey show. Um, the newspapers couldn't get enough of this. You know, I was doing interviews all the time. It was great. However, when I needed to go on the job market, I had to do my dissertation. Um, I was going to end up that you know in training to be a professor, a marketing professor at a business school, and the good business schools really weren't going to hire the dating service guy. That was not going to go. Uh, but I had read all this work on the psychology of love because I had to understand dating services. So I'd spent years, really, at that point, studying the psychology of love and how people fall in love and what love is. And so I thought, well, I don't want to have all that work go to waste. Why don't I take a look at things people love and products they love and activities they love and brands they love? And that just turned out to be a, a, a wonderful idea that I kind of stumbled into. And now that area of research has grown. And you mentioned that I have been sort of influential in the field. And it's really because I picked an excellent topic 
And I fell into it. It wasn't any brilliance on my part. And as that topic has become much more interesting to people, um, my work has become better known. Yeah, that's a great, uh, just a great story and, and awesome how you've gotten to, to live your life doing what you love and studying and then sharing it with people all over the world. And, and uh, so let me just ask, and again, it's a broad question and, uh, you know, what is love? And I'll, I'll let you define the space of how you're going to answer that because you can just take it so many different ways. But uh, yeah, explore that a little bit with the listeners. So there is no really good scientific definition of love. One of the things that happened in the research on love is that People, philosophers, and then psychologists for thousands of years tried to come up with some tight definition that would, you know, be like, this really gets everything that's love is under this definition. And if it, nothing that isn't love is under the definition. Um, <clears throat> finally, people just gave up. They came to realize that love doesn't work that way. Love is a system of different psychological properties and processes. And you've got some things that are definitely love, some things that aren't, and a lot of things that are kind of on the fuzzy boundary and you know, they're kind of sort of love and they're, you're not quite sure what to do with them. And that's just the nature of the beast. So, the, so I'm not gonna be able to give you a really strict definition of love. However, I can tell you this, uh, one thing that all love relationships have in common is that at a non-conscious psychological level, when a person falls in love with another person or with an object or an activity they love, their sense of identity, their sense of who they are, opens up and spreads out and comes to include that person or thing that they love. So loving another person or, or loving an activity or the object is a process of taking that and making it part of who you are. And there's other parts to it also, because there are, of course, parts of ourself that we don't love. We might have bad habits. We might, I've got a few extra pounds that are part of myself that I don't love. So it's not enough that it's a part of yourself. It has to be something that you really want to be part of yourself, that you feel good about and you aspire towards. So if I were to give a quick definition, I would say that loving something or someone is finding them so excellent that you want to make them part of who you are. Mm -hmm. Love it. I love it. Yeah, this was a stumper for me. I mean, I really struggled trying to come up and I'm glad so many people way smarter than me said, hey, this is too hard of a thing to really exactly define. I want to share what I wrote down and then you can kind of analyze me. And this was tough. This was tough because there's so many different ways to take it. Um, and it's mine is in reference to, you know, uh, mostly just thinking about my wife. So in reference to a, another human being, but an awareness of the emotions you and your partner experience running to the ones that make your heart pitter patter and sitting quietly listening to the ones that cause you to pause. Wow, that's that's beautiful, man. <laughs> that's really nice. And, and what you're doing there is actually defining love the way psychologically people truly define love. So the way that a person knows love is that the person has an image in their mind of what kind of feelings, what kind of behaviors, what kind of thoughts are indicative to, to love? And then they look at this thing and they say, well, how closely does it fit with this stereotype that I have, what psychologists call a prototype, but for all practical purposes, we can just call it a stereotype. You've got the stereotype of what love is like. And so if I, do I love this car? How close does that car match this stereotype that I have in my mind? And what you've just done there is you've given a nice, very literary uh, encapsulation of what love looks like and feels like to you in action. And that's very much part of this prototype or stereotype that you hold of what, what love is. 
Well, yeah, I'm still processing it. That was a difficult assignment, but in, in listening to you right now, I, you know, the way a person knows love is the image that person has of love. And now I want to get into your marketing and more on the consumer side and the confusion around the psychologist and, uh, and getting people to purchase things of what they think is love and going to bring them love, but actually just can lead to, to other problems. And, and the image of, Hey, that shirt, those pants, are going to allow me to feel this. And then we get those things and it didn't have anything to do with helping me, you know, feel better about myself. And uh, so explore maybe some, some marketing, some, some insight on kind of people purchasing things that we think that are going to help us, you know, get into that space and feel something. Then we get them. And it like has nothing to do with that. Yeah. That's, I actually published a paper not long ago, looking exactly at this issue. And we were looking at people who love brands. And there's also measures, psychological measures you can do to measure how materialistic a person is. And so we gave people those measures and assess their level of materialism. And it should not surprise anyone to learn that you know, people who love a lot of brands tend on average to be more materialistic uh, than people who don't. However, we also found that there really was a difference that loving things and being materialistic, while they were sometimes correlated, they're not the same thing. And one of the differences that we found is that very often when people love a product or a brand, what, the way they come to love it is they buy one, they use it, they discover, wow, this really works well, right? Um, and they come to really appreciate how well it works. Very often, they don't want to buy more because they love the one they have. So it doesn't actually cause them to want to purchase more necessarily. Um, people who love their car keep their car longer and buy fewer cars than people who don't love their cars, right? So that's sort of the, the, the love aspect of loving something in particular. The materialism aspect is a little different and materialists, I believe, often love the brand more than they love any given product. So it's not so much that like, I love my car, it's that I love Porsche as a brand. Right? Um, and frequently loving the brand really does motivate people because they want to express that love by buying more things from the brand. So they, they are buying more stuff. And sometimes when this gets connected to materialism, materialists have a very interesting pattern. And this next part comes from research from Marsha Richens, who did a lot of the pioneering research on materialism. And for materialists, the most pleasure they get from the things they buy occurs before they ever buy it. They have these fantasies about how nice it's going to be to own that thing. And those fantasies are so pleasurable to them that that's the greatest enjoyment they get from the product then eventually they buy this thing. And from the minute they buy it, their enjoyment starts to go down because it's not providing, the, it's not changing who they are as a person. It's not making them more popular. It's not solving those kinds of deep seated problems that they have. Uh, and instead of saying, oh, well, I guess this strategy of trying to fix my psychological problems by buying an expensive gadget or, item of some kind, I guess that strategy doesn't work. No, they say, oh, that wasn't the right one. I must need to buy something else. And so they go on in this sort of consistent cycle of purchase. Um, but that's just to sort of close up, you can see the difference there between one person who buys something and uses it and gets a lot of enjoyment out of it and falls in love with it for that reason versus somebody else who buys something and finds it immediately disappointing and doesn't really enjoy it and doesn't get a lot of use out of it and goes on to buy something else. Yeah, I just, I'm going back to not to put somebody into a, a category, but that, that person that you were describing that just had the fantasy of, you know, they get their dopamine kick from ordering 
and then they get it and say, nope, I need that. That wasn't, that didn't give me the high that I was looking for. Right. Uh, and just leads to more and more depth. Wondering if they were going to be in that same category of not having any close friends, you know? Yeah, there is, there is research on that. Yeah. And yet people who are uh, materialistic in that way tend to be lonely and there was actually some nice research that was done that looked at the cause and effect of this and found that there was a vicious cycle. So people who are lonely turn to that kind of materialism as a way to try and escape their feelings of loneliness. And, and stuff cannot cure loneliness, but it can sometimes at least alleviate boredom. So they're not really curing the underlying feeling of loneliness, but if it keeps you busy and thinking about stuff, you don't notice your loneliness as much because you're not as you're not as bored, right? Um, so the, the the loneliness causes the materialism, and then the materialism exacerbates the loneliness and makes that worse as well. So you've got this, you know, really unhappy cycle there. Conversely. Uh, the people, if you ask people, is there anything in your home that you love, like an object in your home that you love? There was work done a, a while ago by uh, Rushbrook Halton and uh, another psychologist, Chicksent Mahai, who became very famous later, that looked at this. And they discovered that people who have a lot of objects that they really love and cherish, those people tend to have stronger and better relationships with other people. First of all, because a lot of those times, a lot of those things are mementos of those relationships. So yeah, I have things that I cherish. It's this book that I got as a gift from my best friend, right? And if you've got a lot of good friends and you've got more gifts that you got from your friends because you got more friends. So it sort of, it makes sense that having strong relationships would lead to having more of these objects. But at the other side was also true. And that is that some people are just relationship prone. They're prone to form deep connections and they form deep connections with people and they form deep connections with objects. And that's, as again, as I was saying in the beginning, that's great. I got, you know, we really should give people grief about that just because some of that involves physical objects. We should keep our eyes on what's important, which is for those people, their connections with objects enhance their relationships with other people. And what's really important is the relationship with other people. And if the object works to do that, God bless, go for it. But if the object isn't doing that, if you're lonely and your social life isn't working, um, you need to find a better strategy for fixing your social life and it's probably not buying, you know, prestige items, you know, branded goods that you think are going to, you know, improve your image. That's really not how you're going to fix that problem. Yeah. And you're probably not aware, but this, this show is part of a nonprofit called C4 Leaders and C4 Leaders uses pizza to bring people together and build community. So that would be the things that we're purchasing, our material goods to use that to create an opportunity for people to just come and experience life and to, to be there and use their hands uh, and engage and talk. Um, and so, uh, yeah, no, I love it. But let's get into your book. Uh, again, we are talking with Dr. Ahuvia from University of Michigan. Uh, he wrote a book in July of 22, uh, The Things We Love. I know you all this stuff has been probably part of your book that we've been talking about, but maybe even share too just what inspired you to write the book. Um, and then, um, yeah, share whatever part uh, of that you want. Yeah, so I have been doing research in this area for 30 years, and I really wanted to bring it to a wider audience. So, you know, I got dozens, many, many academic papers uh, that are, you know, anyone who wants to read them, go to the website, The Things We Love. And if you go on about Aaron and his work is one link there, click on that and you can see at the bottom of the page, you can download the academic work if you want. But that can be a little dense and a little hard to get through. Uh, 
so I wanted to write something that was going to be fun and funny and engaging to read that would help people understand their relationships with objects because we live in this world that's just full of stuff and we have relationships with these objects uh, and we'd like to have healthy relationships that support us as people and not you know unhealthy relationships that do the opposite yeah, I, I love that well let's get into get in what 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 was the process for you of of writing a book. I know you're a writer from doing all your research, um, but how was that of uh, just going through that whole process and getting it out? And did you self-publish? I mean, what's what did you do uh, to get your book out there? So the book is published by Little Brown, which is a wonderful publisher. And the process was a surprise to me. So when I started writing the book, I assumed you wrote the book and then you sent it to a publisher. And then they said, no, we don't want to publish this famously. And then you know, maybe if you're lucky that someone would want to publish it. But that's not how the process works anymore. So publishers won't even read things sent to them by individuals. Uh, you need to have an agent. And so the agent is the first screen and the agent knows that if, the, if their reputation with the publisher depends on sending the publisher really good proposals and they won't show anything to a publisher until they're really convinced that it's going to be successful and the publisher is going to want to see that. So I spent six years with my agent going back and forth on ideas and proposals before he felt I had something that a publisher would really be interested in. Once we'd worked that out, uh, we went, uh, we had a, it was terrific. We had a lot of publishers interested in the book. Um, and I was able to get a sabbatical. So then it was 18 months, eight hours a day, six days a week writing to uh, actually, you know, craft the book. And it took uh, about maybe a year on either side of that as well, where I wasn't able to work on it full time. So it's, it's, it was a long process, but I'm really pleased with the way it came out. Uh, Amazon has given it the best nonfiction designation, which I'm really proud of. And so it seems to have been successful. Uh, congratulations on that. Yeah, I'm definitely gonna have to get a copy and uh, yeah, appreciate the insight for anybody that's potentially looking to, to write a book. Uh, I just wrote a, a children's book and I'm writing a book series. And so your tip on trying to find uh, an agent will be helpful, you know, and uh, my books on Amazon, but it's, there's like 2 million over almost close to 3 million books in the category. And so nobody's going to know about, about my book. And uh, so, yeah, I need to find some help with that. Uh, uh, do you have plans on, on writing another one? I do. Uh, oh, I, do. I, I, I do. I'm, I'm still working on figuring out what exactly I want to write on. I have a number of ideas, um, but it might have something to do with the, the happiness literature, which I'm pretty familiar with but it also might be sort of a social critique of marketing uh, in, in America and, and how that could be made to be more beneficial to people. I love it. I love it. Well, thanks uh, for, again, doing that future work. Uh, we're at the point, we're almost at the end of the show and John Alston has a great quote that I love and I don't want to get too morbid with you, but you told me you're 58. Hopefully you got another 40 productive years and you're living your life and uh, you got your cruise director hat on and you've built up that Ann Arbor community. Um, but uh, now your time has come and you're on your deathbed. And uh, his quote is the only thing you take with you when you're gone is what you leave behind. What is it that you want your, your students, your family, your friends to have known that you stood for? Wow. That's so heavy. It's tough. It's tough. 
Well, you know, I'm going to quote the Beatles, right? That's what came to mind as you were saying that, you know, and in the end, the love you take is equal to the love you make. Mm -hmm. And I hope that, you know, I helped produce some love in this world uh, beyond just the love that I myself got to enjoy directly. That would be nice. And what a great way uh, to end the show. Again, listeners, we've been on uh, Season 2, Episode 43 with Dr. Aaron Ahuvia from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Make sure you check out his site, thethingswelove.com. That is his new book that just got uh, acknowledgement from uh, Amazon and getting some awards, so thethingswelove.com. We thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, listeners, thank you for uh, tuning in to another episode. Uh, and my Pasha's not here to get us out, so boom, baby, we out. <laughs>